everybody. Welcome to One More Round with Josh Norris. Today, I'm super excited. We have Sarah Sawal with us. She's the founder and designer of Contivo, uh, but an amazing background. She has chosen to uh, create the life that she wanted. We've got a ton of uh, things that you're going to get out of this today. So I'll, before we get started, make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss episodes like this. Make sure to like it. Leave a comment for Sarah and I as well. But uh, let's get into it, Sarah. Let's hey, go. pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, we met through Arte not too, I think the first time we met was only about a month ago. It was. Right? It was. And yes. it, it was cool because I think we were connected on social media before. We were. And then I'm like, man, we have a lot of similarities in people we know and, and you know, how we think. So yes. I'm like, man, we got to get to the Actually, I saw you first at the Not, uh, not Most People event. That's right. But connected the fact that we were both in our day, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Bradley Roth, shout out to, to Bradley, um, not most people, um, but uh, you've got a very unique story. Um, you know, first off, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah, I've been here in Arizona since 20, 2012. 2012, okay. Yeah. What brought you out here? Family. Family? Yeah, family. Awesome, and, and uh, do you like it out here as opposed to Wisconsin? I like it better than Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> But there's pros and cons. You yeah. know, I really miss the green, the water sources, you know, the four seasons of Wisconsin. Um, I should say I miss two of the seasons. I don't miss the winters, which is why I'm still here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do miss the greenery, but um, not enough to move back. I don't so. know many people that move back, to be honest with you. And, and like Wisconsin, you could throw I mean, Minnesota in there. I mean, it would have to take a pretty extreme situation for me to go back. So yeah. I can't say it would not be outside of the realm of possibility, but it's it's pretty slim at this point in my life. Awesome. Well, yeah. you know, we were talking before this and you've had, I mean, quite the amount of life changes in the last 12 months. Uh, you've got an amazing background. You've always made really, really good money and some really niche things, which we'll get into. But you started uh, Contivo uh, how many years ago? Um, technically, I started it in 2020. Okay. Um, initially launched in 2020. Um, ran into did really well for like six months and then ran into just you know manufacturing issues you ran into 2020 oh yeah <laughs> a lot of 2020 issues. is just like um and at the same time i was going through a separation so it was just life life and business complications were hitting me hard at the same time so I kept it going, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't. Pr I didn't push it. I didn't grow it. I didn't seek to um, market it. Mm -hmm. I just. I let everything kind of just stay, stay at standstill. And then what came in on its own through, you know, people coming across the brand. Obviously, I. I managed that, but I didn't do anything to grow it mm -hmm. for the reason. And then 2021, I um, went back to the drawing board and figured out what was working, what wasn't working with it, because um, I knew I still wanted to to pursue it with the vision I had for it. Um, so I just, I didn't start over, um, but I definitely made a long list of things that needed to change with it and made all the changes and then relaunched it this, this year as far as with uh, all the improvements and um, manufacturing changes, product changes, all of that kind of the Huge. unglamorous side of it. And for those of uh, us that don't know, like what what is the brand and how did you come up with yes. the, the so product? Yes, so Contivo is a line of uh, lunch bags, meal prep bags. Um, they're all on the large side though, so mm -hmm. they, that's kind of the niche market is a large enough bag to pack a full day's worth of food. And our customer base is women is who I market to. Um, but it is basically women uh, where we found a niche is women that are gone all day long, um, commuters, nurses, students, um, lawyers, quite a few of those, uh, basically women that need to pack a full day's worth of food. Um, how I got into it was kind of, kind of accidental in a way. It was based on my own need, having been uh, working long hours, working out, um, also had kids that were in high school and sports. I would be gone all day myself mm -hmm. and needed to pack a full day's worth of food and didn't, um, you know, there's a couple other brands out there that offer large meal prep bags, but they weren't, they didn't fit my style. And then the smaller ones were just that, they were too small. So I thought I could do it better and design something yes. better and that's that's how it started it started with one and it's just kind of taken on a life of its own um contivo because this comes up uh it actually means i contain in portuguese so um the bigger vision for the brand is obviously the product contains items mm -hmm. um but the 
the goal that I have is to build a community of women around the brand Mm -hmm. and everybody who tries to watch what they eat obviously have some some interest in personal care Mm -hmm. self improvements just being their best selves and that I contain is kind of a a spin-off too of where I want to go with it in terms of a community of women who are focused on bringing out the best that they contain. So there you a go. dual spin on that. No, I love that. Uh, have you done a video talking about specifically that? I am working on that right now. Yeah, I was going to tell you, yeah, you, you I definitely work, should. I am working on that. Uh, it's in the works right now. So yeah. your product uh, is, it's like a manufactured um, you know, bag, right? Mm-hmm. So where did you start? How did you find the people to do this? <laughs> How did you design it? Yeah, so I started, I sketched it. I, I fortunately have had some amazing manufacturers that work with me on sketches because I, I, I've gotten better at creating a tech pack, which is a technical instruction, you know, with a drawing and all the specifics of how you want the bag manufactured um, in manufacturing language. But um, it started with just a sketch, you know, just pictures of what I wanted it to look like. Mm-hmm. And I found a manufacturer on Alibaba. Okay. Um, the first go around, to keep in mind, this is where I learned all the mistakes was grossly taken advantage of in terms of cost yeah. and um, the quality of the product wasn't up to turned out it wasn't up to my standard um, but then I just went back and just kept digging and digging until I could find a good manufacturer and who I who I have now is amazing um, they've actually been educating me a lot on the process so the there's good manufacturers out there and you can find what you need to find if you just relentlessly keep digging. And Google has all the answers for it. Just keep digging on Google. Um, but I started with Alibaba, and that's where I found most of my manufacturers. But the current one that I have uh, for the lunch bag specifically was was through Google searching. Um, and you'll well, what I found is a lot of them want to help you. Like they yeah. really want to help businesses succeed because if we succeed, they're going to succeed. They got a customer so for a long So if you get time. a good manufacturer, they will want to help you. Um, and fortunately, I have that right now as a, as a really good one that's that's helping with me with this process as well. So it's awesome. Um, so when uh, like, let's dig in a little bit. Like, what are you looking for in a good manufacturer? If somebody is looking to start a product communication, business, communication, is key. okay. Um, the the manufacturer I have now, their communication from their sales rep is above and beyond. Um, and also one that is going to educate you. So if they're just doing everything you tell them to do, which is not a bad thing per se, but when you don't know what you're doing yet, yeah. that that was you know the mistakes. One of the things I learned is my first manufacturer did everything exactly as I told them, but I didn't even know what the hell I was doing. Mm-hmm. So the result is like, you kind of want a little bit of feedback, <laughs> right? A little pushback. Right. Yeah. Um, so the manufacturer I have now, I mean, still, I'll send them a tech pack, you know, with instructions of, hey, this is what I want made. Uh, they won't hesitate to send back and say, hey, you know, if you want this, we'll do it. But our design team is recommending these changes because this is what you might encounter if you do it that way. Mm-hmm. And that that has been invaluable. Um, so I would say a manufacturer that is not afraid to tell you where something could be improved upon yeah. and willing to show you how to do that. Yeah, I mean, probably things like straps, lengths, everything. Uh, fastening. So it was more so zippers, you okay. know, zipper types. It was like, okay, this there's, there's called teeth size of zippers and mm-hmm. things like that, very technical things. And I would, what I thought would work well, they were like, uh, you know, six months down the road, it, you're probably gonna have issues with it or you know, they'd give different feedback. Um, and then even the material, you know, there's different types of uh, materials you can use and thicknesses to them and very little nuance type mm-hmm. changes. And they've made recommendations there that that make sense. So I would say 10 out of 10 times I go with a change because they're the ones in the industry, they know yeah. what they're doing. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. So, you know, this business, obviously you've had for a little while, but you're, you know, now it's your full time. This is your passion and everything you're doing. Uh, But you left a pretty, I mean, a pretty handsome uh, salary and, you know, made a lot of money in your previous career. Um, Most, I, since, so I left my career last summer, so about a year ago. Um, And for the 10 years uh, up until I left, I was mid six figures. Um, was what I was earning mo- in most years. Yeah. Um, great living. I loved the company I worked for. Uh, it was a school bus dealership. Ironically, it was a very niche market. Yeah. Um, 
love the company I worked for, liked the job, but it wasn't a passion. You mm-hmm. know, it's still a job. It's still yeah. a dead end, so to speak, in that you're you're capped there. You're never going to do better than that um, unless you somehow take it over. Uh, so I was it wasn't good enough for me. Like it mm-hmm. just didn't it didn't speak to my soul of what I really wanted my life to look like. So I uh, I left it. I wow. left it last summer. Um, I haven't regretted leaving it at all. And you know I've had the naysayers around in shock that I left left my career to pursue what I'm doing. But um, I have no regrets whatsoever. And there's there's quotes. You, uh, most people have probably seen them online. But it's the you know your salary is kind of the price you they give you to to give up on your dreams. Mm-hmm. And that quote just kept resonating with me. And every time. I get cold feet and be like, oh, I don't know, maybe I can do both at the same time and just, you know, keep this job and do this full time on the side. Um, that quote would pop up in my feet again. So it was just like, it just kept gnawing at me. And I'm yeah. like, it's like your reticular it. activating doing, yeah, system like, went to work. <laughs> exactly. yep. I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm going like, okay. to I'm All gonna right. quit. Um, and when I did quit, it was interesting. My, uh, the leadership at the, the company I worked for, I think, they were like, no, really, who are you going to go work for? Thinking I was going to go work for yeah. the I was like, no, I'm really going to go work for myself. No. Did they recruit you? And I was yeah. like, no, I'm just, I'm giving all this up for for what I want to do over here. Um, That's really cool. Was there a tipping point to make you say it's time to make a decision? Um, the tipping point, ironically, was I felt like I was at my highest point point in terms of what I've achieved, what I had achieved for the company um, in terms of, of revenue in prior years mm-hmm. and sales and salary, you know, sal- my, it wasn't just salary, salary and bonuses and commissions. Um, and I felt like I was at a high and I wanted, in, in not knowing with kind of where the, where things were going within that industry with schools being shut down mm-hmm. on and off and all that, I wanted to go out on a high, okay. and, on a high note. So that was the tipping point, which is maybe the opposite of a tipping point, because it was like, okay, well, I'm, things are really good. This yeah. is when I need to leave so that there was, you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, so you, you left kind of at the pinnacle. I left at the pinnacle. Yeah, yeah. which is great, um, you know, because it's a hard decision to make. I mean, I've been self-employed since 2008. You know, this is when I started Aftershock yeah. uh, Digital. And, you know, back then, I mean, I was... My, my wife, thank God she was supportive, uh, but I was just young, dumb, and hated working for corporate America, uh, even though I learned some good things there. I'm like, but we could make that decision. There wasn't, we didn't have kids yet. Yeah. And you know now we got three kids and, and thank goodness everything's worked out You know, well, but. the attitude I have had about money more so in the later years of my life than the early years, but um, it's just money. Mm-hmm. I can get more of it. Yeah. Um, so if, my life goes to hell in a handbag with my job, you know, business, which I don't, that's not, I just say it's not going to happen because it's, I won't let it happen. But um, hypothetically, by most people's standards of how they would say, well, what if, um, then I go find another job. Yeah. You know, I left at the pinnacle of a career. I'm very hireable. Um, I don't talk about it, but I do have a master's degree. You know, I'm well educated from a resume standpoint. So, you know, if I ever have to go back into the workforce, I go back into the workforce and the worst thing I'm out is some savings. Yeah. You know, and I I love that. Something I heard, uh, I was actually one of my first mentors in life uh, when I was young, 19, 20 years old. And uh, we're, he was just talking about making decisions. He's like, anytime you're making a a big life altering decision, think what's the worst case scenario that's going to happen. If you can live with that, then the upside is great. That's exactly it. it. The worst case scenario it pales in comparison to the best case scenario. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and but during this time, you decide to make this change. You said that you were going through a relationship change mm-hmm. as well. So I was. I someone once told me I'll kind of back it up a little bit. Someone someone told me recently that my pendulum swings one way or the other, like mm-hmm. I'm all in or I'm all out, and and I'm. Good or bad. Yeah. That's how I operate. That's all of my how life. I operate. So I understand. <laughs> that's, all, that's how I operate in all of my life. So I um, was married for 15 years in a very uh, abusive relationship and had just hit a rock bottom with that. At the same time, my kids were, uh, one was going off to college 
two were seniors in high school, so they were going to soon be, Mm -hmm. you know, on their way out. And uh, I just, and I was, again, content with my career, but it wasn't what I wanted. I didn't want to work for someone else and, and kind of just be stuck at this salary for the rest of my life. So I, I literally just wrote out everything I wasn't happy with in my life. And I was also approaching 40 at that point. So you could say midlife crisis, but, um, to me, I saw it as an opportunity to rewrite my story. Yeah. So I did. And in a matter of 12 months, now I'm a year past this. So it started to, this process started two years ago. Um, but in a matter of 12 months, I filed for and got a divorce, sold the family home. Three kids all went off onto their own and quit my job and went, went to full speed on the business. So, yeah. um, that, that's awesome. Um, was there anything that helped you in this process that, like books or things? Tons that- and tons and tons of reading and podcasts and journaling. That's all, that's all I focused on. And now it's, you know, just a part of my, it's just my everyday life. Um, but I went, I went all in on every consuming everything self improvement um, that I could find mm-hmm. to the point where I don't even listen. I rarely listen to music. For me, is when I'm working out. Mm-hmm. Um, it is just reading and consuming as much knowledge as I possibly can. Podcasts is probably the number one source. Um, but uh, and part of that is part of the. The, the, a major piece of this to me, for me as well, it, that is not related to podcasts and content someone is putting out. Um, for me to make these switches, there is a there's a big internal dialogue switch you have to make. Mm-hmm. And I had a lot of, I held on to a lot of regret of past decisions in my life. You know, whether it was the relationship or things I could have done better as a parent by having not been in certain that, you know, that, that marriage and things like that. Um, or even, even career. It was like, okay, this is a great career, but I'm not happy. I'm not helping anybody. I'm just making a living for my family, but I'm not really having an impact on anybody. It's very transactional. Yes. Very transactional and just self focused, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, so to, I knew that to do and envision the life that I wanted and to, positively impact other people at the same time I had to to really be good with myself and that took a lot of um self-reflection and Mm self-forgiveness so realizing that I operated from what I knew best and how to operate my life at that point it no longer served me and I'm going to forgive myself for this not look back and just move forward. So there's a self forgiveness piece that was very, very pivotal, yeah. very instrumental for me. Now that that's, I mean, everybody listening to this yeah. should take some of that and be like, okay, what am I? What story am I telling myself yeah. that doesn't serve me? Um, it's ironic that you're talking about this right now. I'm reading this book called uh, The Breakthrough Code. Mm-hmm. Great book by Tom McCavity. If you guys or Tom McCarthy, okay. if anybody wants to pick it up, but it's uh, it's talking about one of the the steps of the Breakthrough Code is. What is that internal story? Am I telling myself yeah. what isn't serving me? How do I change that story yeah. to serve where I want to go? And yeah. that's a huge thing that we do as people. And I I have seen a lot more information on it since doing it. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was I hadn't even read anything up until this point. It was it was when I really hit that that rock bottom, as I had mentioned, where I made the decision like I this. This life isn't serving me, and I am yeah. absolutely miserable as as all could be. Um, for me, I knew that I needed to make the changes. Not only because did I want my life to look dramatically different the second half of it, mm. um, get, you know, again approaching forty at that point. I also had looked at my my kids, and I'm like, shit, they're coming into adulthood, and I didn't feel like I had lived up to what I could have been as a role model for them in terms of what how I would want them to live their life. So Mm -hmm. I couldn't sit there and tell them what they should do. I knew I had to show it, um, whether it was through what to or not put up with in a relationship or what to or not pursue in terms of their career ambitions or dreams or, you know, all of that. Um, So that was that was another instrumental psychologically for me of why I needed to do it was to really just role model for them you can change your story at any given time. Yeah. And 
I had to live it out first for them to see that and so they just try to tell them. That's awesome. So how, how is the, the relationship with your kids? It is, I never thought it was, it was never bad. The mm-hmm. relationship with my kids was never bad. Um, but I didn't realize just how close it could be until the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where I realized that it was as close. I was as close to them as I could be with where I was at psychologically. You know, you, they say you love to the capacity that you love yourself and what you're putting out. That is so accurate. Um, so accurate. And I would say a year. And so I started these changes two years ago. Um, after about a full year is where the, the relationships with all three of them has continued to get deeper and deeper because they have all commented on and noticed dramatic changes and, yeah. and see that. And there's a trust that's built with that. Um, I, the, this is another self-realization I had, but it was like, you can't, your kids aren't going to trust you to build a really close relationship with you as close as it could be if they don't first respect you in my opinion and i don't think that the example i was was of the the highest level of respect one could possibly try to model Mm -hmm. um so once i became more Mm -hmm. um that relationship those relationships have gotten deeper yeah it's it's amazing with kids because i have three kids as well uh 12 10 and 5 and I never realized up until a couple of years ago how much they watch. Oh, everything. Everything, everything. you know, and like my good things, my bad things. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, yeah, I don't want them to do that. <laughs> I want them to pick up this piece of me. And then, but yeah, oh, consciously you start to think, okay, well, it's all of it. how can I model better for yeah. them? And I'm, you, nobody's perfect, but like, yeah. you know, you don't want to, you don't want to screw them up basically. Um, <laughs> There's so many, you know, I, I, I no longer sit and think about all the things I could have and should have done differently with them because I'm doing it now. Yeah. So my focus is I'm going to show you right now exactly, you know, how things can be. Um, and it's what's interesting, though, is it's now because they are older, they don't think as black and white. It's more gray area for them and they can kind of look at things um, differently. So it's a good time. It's not all is lost not all is lost i guess is what i'm trying to say because they are at a point where they're more observatory or as equally observatory as they were as kids but now they can actually apply it yeah. and have a better understanding to it and they have a better appreciation i think for oh that's some hard shit because i'm an adult now and i know that that's not easy and i'm and watching me make changes yeah um it, it makes a lot a of sense. Bit different context for them so and i know uh i know fitness is something that's big in your life right mm-hmm. Where did that come from? <laughs> I mean, if we're really, really honest about it, <laughs> it started with a chip on my shoulder when I was a teenager. Um, so when I was like 15, so I was homeschooled. Okay. Go back and forth. I was homeschooled my whole life. And I ne- so I never had the opportunity to play in sports or, you know, really do any kind of team team related thing. And when I was 15, I came across a, a magazine, a fitness and bodybuilding related magazine. And I was like, damn, that those women look jacked. Like yeah. I just loved how they looked. And it was um, a way for me to one, start something I could do on my own that didn't need a team, team mm-hmm. sport. Um, I also was always kind of a rebel. So I looked at the the women with muscle as being like an extra element of me being able to. A little flex. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for, <laughs> for sure. Ironically, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I'm, I can, I can admit this now. Um, so that's where it started. Started that I, I, I wanted to start at 15, but technically waited till I was 16 because I couldn't drive. So mm-hmm. I had to wait till I was old enough to drive. And I mean, I did things at the house to what I could. And then uh, once I got my driver's license, uh, one of the first things they did was went and got a gym membership. And um, so what, 20, 25, 20, 24, 25 years later, I'm still doing it. My uh, my mom thought it was a phase, mm-hmm. you know, when I started, she wasn't a big fan of it. but. Um, They've all they've all kind of turned around. They've all come around as far as yeah. seeing the benefits this many years later of having started. Uh, and what are the main benefits you found from it, other than being jacked? Yeah. So uh. um, what I have found for me uh, applicable to especially where I'm going now in life with the business and and everything I envision is I I tie it back to 
my fitness journey is when I, I remember looking at different photos of different women over the, you know, the early years Mm -hmm. and be like, man, if I could just look like that, if I could, if I could do that, these things that I thought were completely unattainable and now I've either done it or surpassed it. Mm -hmm. So I've seen through fitness where when you put your mind to something and you envision it, even, even if you're so far over here, you know, for example, in this, this example, appearance Mm -hmm. purposes, I'm so far over here. It's hard to possibly imagine that I could get here, Mm -hmm. but I envisioned it long enough and put the action into it long enough and reached it and, and surpassed it. So I've, I know through proof and application that if I do those same things with my business yeah. and my vision with everything else, that there's no reason I can't attain it. I love that. So you so. basically, it was a mental muscle that you built yeah. more than more just than a body a, oh, muscle. Mental muscle more than any of it, which is why I think I've stuck with it as long as I have and, <laughs> and couldn't not do it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So where, where do you see, you know, your business going and, you know, what, what, what are your ambitions? Oh, they're really big. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to give you an idea of the size of that industry, it's, it's in the billions and people don't realize that something is as simple as a lunch bag. Um, but my, my vision is to have it be a long, uh, within 10 years, be a nine figure brand wow. and obviously it'd have offshoots mm-hmm. you know so instead of just this specific niche of lunch bag all different types of insulated cooler bags and um but everything's still within that that you know spectrum whether it turns into hard coolers you know time will tell but um that's revenue size but the the bigger vision actually is more so with the the way the business is operated and one of the things I think where I get the most joy from with the business is is truly getting to know the customers Mm -hmm. and have I have immense gratitude for each and every one of them Um, and that's the joy I get with running it and I want to do that on a large scale and give back um, more than I receive or you know at least yeah can't say more I'd go bankrupt but you know yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean give back more value value yeah yeah um than I receive and have it just be like this my vision as a company once I get beyond a home office is this completely kick-ass company to work for um ideally mostly run and operated with women because that's kind of mm-hmm. where I you know what I want to where I want to where I think I can have the most impact um but yeah, I have a I have a vision of what that company looks like to work for, and it's going to be pretty pretty cool. Awesome! I can't um, wait to watch it grow and change. Anything I can do to help, you know, let me know. Yeah, um, one one thing I want to comment on too with that is where I was kind of saying why I I have this passion with the female side of it and kind of women women it being run by women and operated and and stuff with women is I think they're. Where I feel like I can impact people is there's another saying. Uh, you've seen the saying. It's like who be who you needed when you were younger. Mm. You, you, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, like because we all have this inner child that this unhealed inner child. So yes. they say, "Oh, be who you needed when you were younger." I don't like that quote anymore mm. because I think about the years that were really rough for me. Mm. You know, the years when I was married that were just really, really dark. And it was like, well, shit, who, I, I need someone who, you know, who did I need at that point in my life? And it wasn't who I needed as a child. And I think most women um, need in their lives, they need to consider who they need now for where they're at. And I remember craving and yearning um, different types of connections when I was at those low points that I didn't have. So my my vision and where I feel I can be impactful with with women with the brand and employees someday and all that is is being for them who I needed at those dark 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 times in my life I love that so yeah it's awesome are you doing big things I mean it's it's you've already done big things you're doing bigger things it's amazing um hey guy I know you guys got a ton out of this uh how can how can people find you and how can they buy your, uh, your yeah, product. Yeah, so I am on uh, social media, Instagram and Facebook. I'm more active on Instagram though. Um, Sarah with an H, Sawal, S-A-W-A-L-L. Mm. Uh, you can find me on Instagram there. Uh, Facebook too, but I, again, I'm not particularly active on there. Um, 
The business is Contivo with a Q, so Q-O-N-T-E-V-O at Instagram and also the domain name Contivo.com. Awesome. So, yeah. Give her a follow. Make sure that uh, if, if you need a lunch uh, pail for all of your And keep in mind, pack. we do have, they're, I market to women, but there are a few styles on there that are definitely masculine, so... Yeah, oh, exactly. We don't leave, leave the dudes out completely here. <laughs> You're not out uh, completely, so. No, this is awesome. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. And uh, I know you guys got a ton out of it. Make sure to follow Sarah. Um, you know, give us a like and a comment, and we will see you next time.